As always, we're going to talk about the recent games. We're going to be covering the game at Washington and then the home game against the depleted Clippers. They're missing three out of their five starters. But the big story of today's podcast is Danny Ainge. So stay tuned. We're going to cover that in detail, give you our thoughts and opinions on what the uh, new hire of Danny Ainge means for this organization. Before we get going here, as always, please hit that subscribe button. Helps us a ton with our channel. Um, we're trying to grow and get this jazz podcast in front of as many people as we can. So please hit that subscribe button, the notification bell. It helps us to uh, you know, get, get this out and in front of people, hear our thoughts and opinions on jazz basketball. But uh, diving into it, man, jazz against the Wizards. Um, lots of guys get minutes in this game because it ends up being a blowout. My the thing I loved about this game, one of the things I loved about this game and loved seeing is that the Jazz were able to hold a team under 100 points. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that hasn't happened very often for them this year. <laughs> no, and and I get that we're number one in the league in offensive rating, which I love, love the fact that we're there. I felt like our defense is lacking in a lot of areas, though. Rudy's really good, but it seems like, you know, there hasn't been... Eh, Teams have been scoring, I guess. I feel like Bogey stepped up his effort defensively. I feel like Donovan's effort defensively this whole season has been really good. And Rudy, the three-time defense player of the year, is always good at defense. But it seemed like as a whole, the team played solid, sound defense. Yeah. Um, anytime you hold an NBA team, I think for any team playing defense to under 100 points, that's good now, which is crazy because mm -hmm. 10 years ago, it was just kind of like... <laughs> games in the 80s all the time. Yeah. Um, but, you know, go, going forward, it's going to be interesting to see the difference between, you know, playoff time and regular season time, where where those, uh, you know, point totals end up. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, yeah, good win for the Jazz, yeah, playing the Wizards. And I know the Wizards are, you know, up there in the East. What would you say they were? Ooh, good uh, question. Third, I think, fourth. I think they were top four last yeah. time I checked. Yeah. Um, you know, in the, in the East, they're doing well. Oh, they've Com dropped. Oh. They've dropped a bunch. Oh. They're all the way down to eighth now. Oh, okay. They're well. sitting at 500. So they, uh, the Wizards just are not a good team. The East is just bad. It's just no. how it is. Um, so I think a 25-point victory for the Jazz, that's fully expected. And that should happen each time they play the Wizards. Yeah. But again, overall, like I said, good team win, uh, good team defense. Biggest like wow that's a, that's a good game was Hassan Whiteside yeah I agree the Twin Towers this game played really good I I've seen a lot on jazz Twitter and these other uh, you know jazz pages and stuff on Facebook whatnot social media that uh, they're now calling Gobert and Whiteside H&R block <laughs> for Hassan and Rudy I thought that was really clever so whoever did that props to you really clever <laughs> So yeah, we got good old H and R block. Um, real quick though, Washington had twelve turnovers. That goes to show how good you know team defense that the Jazz had. But yeah, I mean you're talking about Hassan Whiteside goes eighteen points, fourteen rebounds, four blocks. Yeah, that's what I. Rudy Gobert has one block, and Hassan Whiteside has four. Yeah, Rudy still goes for twenty points, eleven rebounds. How much of that though, when you watch the game, right? How much of that is I think people don't respect Whiteside and don't think he's going to get to those shots, so he gets a lot of blocks. Yeah. Versus Rudy Gobert, people drive in the paint and they see Rudy and they're like, "Nope, <laughs> not, not even trying." They well, and yeah, he just goes to affect their shot so much more. Guys are launching the ball into the air to yeah. try to get over him. Whereas, yeah, with Hassan Whiteside, he is like crazy long. Yeah. His arms are so long. Yeah. Um, he gets about this high off the ground when he jumps, <laughs> but yeah, his arm just like ends up shooting up there to get the block. But I, I agree completely with that. I think teams fully expect Rudy to contest shots. And so, you know, you see them changing their shot to not get blocked, which results in a lot more misses. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but doesn't pat the stat. Line. No, but doesn't show on the block <laughs> on the block stat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing that has just been really encouraging to me is we are so deep. We are so deep that guys don't have to play more. I mean, Rudy has the most minutes at 28. Everybody else, as far as starters go, are sitting right around 25. 
Clarson's got around 25. Joe's got 22. Like, oh, shoot, I missed this. Donovan does end up with 31 minutes. Yeah. yeah. But Donovan, Donovan's a young pup. Yeah. He can, he can handle it. Speaking of Donovan, his stat line has 28 points, only four assists in this game, but he's been on an offensive tear. I mean, yeah. he wins Western Conference Player of the Week and just has continued. I mean, I, I saw a stat last night. I don't know how last night's game affected it because he did drop in the scoring. But the like, last five games leading up to, to the game against uh, the Clippers, he was averaging like 28-plus points a game. Well, last night he had... Last 29. night he still did good, 27. Oh, 27. Okay. But, but yeah, L- last night he was very efficient too. Anyway, again, not getting there yet. My bad. You're but, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, this, you know, offensive tear he's going on, yeah, the, the points, like the point averages are high, which is great, mm-hmm. but his efficiency is what's been amazing. Yeah. His field goal percentage these past five, yeah. six games has been just phenomenal. I, I think he's... If, 50% or higher most games. If not, he's around like 45 to 50. Yeah. If if your main scorer, your main playmaker, your main shot taker, whatever you want to call it, right? If they are scoring more points than shots attempted, then I think you're doing really good. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so this game against the Wizards, Donovan has 28 points on 20 shots. Game against the Clippers, Donovan has 27 points on 15 shots. Yeah. Like, so yeah, like you said, that goes to show the efficiency that, that he's really just tearing it up. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out too, though, before we move on is Mike Conley, even though these last two games, his scoring hasn't been through the roof against the wizards. He ends up with eight assists, four rebounds, which for his size isn't bad. He only has nine points, five assists against the Clippers. So not as much, but his shooting just has been, he's struggling. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not like he's playing poorly. I no. just, you know, some guys he's, have, he's still helping us. Yeah. More yeah. Than hurts us. It's Definitely. just the numbers. He's, he's in a little bit of a mini slump right now, yeah. but yeah, but yeah, I mean, let's move on to, uh, to the Clippers game. Um, jazz end up having four guys score 20 or more bogey who shoots six for seven from the three point line, which is like awesome. Okay. <laughs> Timeout. <laughs> I know where this is going. <laughs> yeah. If Bogey will play like this, I will continue to apologize about everything I said previously. Okay. And it's not that he's shooting because I don't expect him to shoot like this all the time. You don't. But he is playing within his realm of capability. He's no longer trying to, I mean, maybe once a game he try, goes to that post up move, right? Yeah. But he is dribbling way less. He's not trying to post up. He goes to the rim when it's available. His basketball IQ has increased. And mainly what he's doing is he's standing on the three-point line knocking down threes without dribbling, without doing anything. And that's what we need him to do. Let Clarkson, Conley, and Mitchell create your shots for you, Bogey. Quit trying to create your own. Yeah. And he's been doing that. Yeah. He's just not athletic enough to be able to create in the NBA. No. Um, But yeah. I think the last like five games, I get this whole streak. There's win streaks been impressive. There's just been those switches that we talked about of Mitchell being more efficient, you know, Bogdanovich playing within his capability, not trying to force anything. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would say Mike Conley, like we need him to step up a little bit too, if the jazz want to, you know, really take the next level, but just even those two guys doing what they're doing has completely turned around how the jazz look right now. Because yeah. I, I think Rudy Gobert is doing the same thing he's been doing all year. Mm-hmm. Um, Royce O'Neal's doing the same thing he's been doing all year. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, Clark said, everybody else on the team looks the same. Mitchell and Bogdanov has changed. And look how much better the Jazz look because of it. Yep. Yep. I agree. Um, I just realized this. I didn't realize this till right now. Donovan goes two for seven on three points. On threes, two for seven on threes. Didn't miss a single. Didn't miss a single two. Yeah. Donovan made 10, he made eight two point shots, eight for eight from inside the arc. I, uh, I thought, I thought this was just overall a great game to watch because mm-hmm. it's not like the Clippers are a bad team. No, well, they're not a bad team, but backing up to what we said in the intro to this podcast, yeah. 
no Batum, no Paul George, no Kawhi Leonard. Yeah, I agreed. I think even then, like you have some, they're a solid organization. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're I uh I think they're a solid team. I think the Jazz just played really well. Yeah. Defensively, I do think they could have stepped it up a little bit more last night. Um, I guess if you're watching this two nights ago, because we're filming on a Thursday. Yeah. Right. Um, giving the Clippers 103 points, like you said, they're missing some of those key guys. But defensively, as a team, they're a good defensive team. Yeah, they are. I, I, yes. We don't have Kawhi, who's probably their main guy, but everybody else, you know, they're Morris, all good defenders. Morris is great. Yeah, Zubach is pretty good. Reggie Jackson's really good. Um, Bledsoe, Winslow, those yeah, guys can yeah. play a good D. Luke Kennard, not, but <laughs> there's, your <one. laughs> there's your one. Oh, man. Terrence Mann. Yeah. He, he played good D against and, Donovan in the um, playoffs last year. What's his face? Anyways, yeah. So <laughs> those guys, good defensive team. I feel like offensively, though, like letting Morris go for 24. That was um, frustrating to yeah. watch. Okay. My new. I, I was thinking about this a lot after watching the game. My most hated player in the NBA used to be James Harden. Since he went to Brooklyn, for some reason, I don't mind him He's that just much. He's quiet now. I feel yeah, like. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind him that much. It's not like I like him, but I don't hate him. My new most hated player in the NBA is Marcus Morris. Yeah. After all the crap with Jokic, I just, I hate that guy's attitude. Yeah. And then watch him to go for 24 like that really pissed me off. So leave it in the comments. Who's your most hated player in the NBA? Dylan? I'm going either Patrick Beverly. Ooh. Yeah. And if you didn't catch our last podcast with the shade he threw at Rudy Gobert, check yeah. that out. <laughs> the Morris, yeah, he's up there. Um, also, and this is kind of controversial, I hate Chris Paul. I do hate Chris Paul, too. <laughs> I hate Chris Paul, but I can respect his Yeah, game. he's dang good. It's like James Harden. Like, yeah. Like, they're dang good. Well, yeah. It, they're, Morris, they're... Morris, I feel like, gets lucky more than anything, <laughs> and he thinks he's... Amazing. Yeah. An elite NBA player. Yeah, I was going to say something I shouldn't say on this family-friendly <laughs> podcast, but he thinks yeah. he's hot crap. Yeah. I. Yeah. Uh, and that's the same thing with, like, Patrick Beverly, why I hate him so much, yeah. too, because they're like, they act like they're an elite, the the top 2% of yeah. the NBA. Yeah. And they're, they're just an average NBA player. Um, anyways, moving on from that. We did, sorry, oh. one last thing on the Clippers side. We did force 16 turnovers. Yeah, that's awesome. We had nine. Anytime you can keep it under 10 in the NBA, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's dang good. Um, so moving on. I think the biggest key point of this podcast, what we really want to talk about, Mr. Danny Ainge, Mr. BYU. Yes. We would love to hear everybody else's opinions as well on what Danny Ainge coming to the organization means. Leave it in the comments. We'll reply. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, think this is getting a little bit more hyped up than it should. How so? I don't think Danny Ainge is really going to have this huge role. Like it seems like everybody's making it out to be. Um, he's got the title. He does have the title. So he, you know, steps down in Boston because of, yeah. you know, has two heart attacks. Says yeah. he wants to be with his family. more. Y yep. Uh, done working 18 hour days. Yeah. So, you know, and we talk about, you know, they, they've mentioned these articles. So Danny Ainge, big picture stuff, just in Zanuck, more of, you know, day to day operation. Yeah. Big picture stuff, Danny Ainge, I doubt he's just like, it, I, I'm guessing he's in the office like, you know, 15 to 20 hours a week. Um, and I don't think he's going to have this huge role like all these articles are making out to be. I think it's a good hire for the Jazz. Mm -hmm. Like, don't get me wrong. I think, number one, he's smart, good basketball guy, knows Utah. Um, and anytime you can fit put somebody into your system that – knows the system and knows what your your goals and what you're trying to accomplish which i think danny ainge coming into this already does mm -hmm. uh i think that's a i think it's a good hire but i don't think it's going to be like this huge you know huge change for the jazz i think it's going to be um a more behind the scenes type look just I, I think he's a smart guy and obviously in boston you see that you know he has the 2008 championship he he built the the you know yeah they're uh the big three yeah. yeah, so appreciate your opinion. 
facts. Looking, looking at the look. Let's look at the facts. Let's look at his career for a second. Right, he spends 18 years as the Celtics' top basketball executive. 18 years with one organization in the NBA is a really long time and is impressive that an organization would keep you there that long. Yeah. And like you said, he stepped down. Yeah. He was not fired. He stepped down. So, I mean, he's got his playing career, you know, won player of the year in college, did all those great things right in the NBA, whatever, right? But looking at his his career as an executive, spends 18 years there. He won the 2008 championship with the Celtics. They reached the Eastern Conference Finals in 17, 18, and 2020. And he was the executive of the year in 2008, right? So he's got a bit of a pedigree as an executive as well. Yeah. Um, the other facts that I think are interesting and kind of a funny story is that, okay, Ryan Smith, I, I want a lifetime series or an MTV show or what... <laughs> what have you, following that guy around. Yeah, he's everywhere. I, he is everywhere <laughs> and doing everything. So so the, the back story to this is he gets asked by Tony Finau to go and caddy for him in a PGA tournament. I didn't realize Ryan Smith, I knew he golfed, yeah. but I didn't realize he was such a good golfer and had such a good relationship with Tony that he would then <laughs> be, his be his caddy, that Tony would ask him to be his caddy. Yeah. So his caddy's hurt, whatever. He goes, Ryan Smith goes to the Bahamas with Tony Finau. Ryan Smith in the back of his mind is like, hmm, this is a good opportunity to hire Danny Ainge. So Ryan Smith reaches out to Danny Ainge and just tells him, hey, you should come down this golf trip with us. Tony and I are going, you should come with, it'll be loads of fun. And then they come back having reached an agreement for Ainge to then join, right? Yeah. I think it's really funny. Um, when Ryan Smith was asked about it, when ESPN asked Ryan Smith what happened on that trip, Ryan says, you know, if you have DA, Danny Ainge, if you have DA sitting 20 minutes away in Utah, you put him to work, right? Everyone is always asked, is this the plan? Was that the plan? Well, it definitely wasn't Danny's plan until last week. <laughs> so that to me is the answer that as soon as Ryan Smith saw him step down, Ryan Smith was like, I'm going to get that guy. We need the talent. We need him in our organization. Danny Ainge, when he stepped down, probably had no intentions of working for Utah. Maybe it was in the back of his mind, but I don't think he had any plans to come work for the Jazz this soon. No. Um, hopping into a KSL article I was reading about, uh, Ryan Miller. Mm -hmm. um, and I, th I think this, again, kind of going to what I was saying about like the, the role that Danny Ainge plays here. Uh, so this is Danny H. Danny H. speaking. He says, I'm not going to be the president of basketball operations. I'm not going to be the guy that's running day to, the day-to-day. -day. That's going to be Justin Sullivan. And that's referring to Justin Zanuck, the jazz GM. Just yeah. Everybody. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll be having an opportunity to communicate with him and share with him the experiences that I've had, but it's not the day-to-day -day load that I had. I'm in load management. Um, and whether or not that changes... And, you know, the article goes on to say the 18 hour days are behind him. Um, he's done that for decades and is ready for something that wouldn't keep him away from his family as much. Yeah. Again, I think he's, he's more than a consultant. Yeah. Um, but I think the jazz go to this hire because of his experience. And I think the jazz have an off an awesome, you know, front office. Yeah. Xanax done a good job. Yeah. Not a ton of experience in the front office. Though. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, new ownership, Xanax. Mm -hmm. You know, he has experience in basketball, obviously, but, you know, how long has he been GM, a this, GM? This is his first role as GM. Yeah. He's been an assistant GM for us, and then also I think he went to Toronto for yeah. a short time. Yeah, and, and like, good. Back. Like, I'm not saying, yeah. like, again, all these guys are he great. He was in Toronto when they won the championship. Yeah. Right. Um, so, for first year as GM, Quinn Snyder, not a new coach anymore. Younger, though. But younger, I think six years, six, I eight years. Like eight years. Jeez. Do you remember time when they flies. hired him? Yeah, that went by fast. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, not a new coach anymore, but still... You know, less than 10 years experience. I think this is, you know, Danny Ainge, 40 years of experience, of NBA experience, plus the, what, 15 years probably, somewhere around yeah. there of being, playing. Yeah, well, 15 years playing, and then 15 years as well as, a, you know, higher up in a oh, NBA organization. Yeah. So he was 18 years with Eight, the Celtics. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this Tons is, experience. A, yeah, I think this is a big, we need well, more experience moving forward. 
what's our big picture? Let's get a guy that knows what he's doing. I wonder too, how much of this hire, yes, he has all the experience, like not knocking that and he has good experience and he's done a good job. Yeah. I wonder how much of this hire was just a name brand recognition thing for Ryan Smith. It seems like Ryan Smith does that a lot. Yes. Like the Dwayne Wade move. Yes. To be like, yeah. Hey, we've got Danny Ainge. Now Danny Ainge is sitting in on our free agency pitch meetings. Yeah. Now Danny Ainge is talking to these players agents when we're trying to the same thing with like, I think Dwayne Wade, a big reason why you get Dwayne Wade on as an owner, right? Free agency could be changing here in Utah. It's all about who, you know, not what you know. Yep. Um, We'll see. Uh, and I think you're right about that too, is f- come free agency time, Utah's never landed big free agents. No. I can't think of one just like massive no, no free superstars. No. Right? We've got some decent guys like, that like we picked up. But. Yeah. Um, but guys that are hitting the end of their career or, yeah. you know, like Jordan Clarkson, great pickup, mm-hmm. was not doing well. No. Like it was, it was an easier pickup because I don't think a lot of other teams wanted him. Joe Johnson was... You know, finishing up his, his career. career. Yeah, Boozer. Boozer was a decent one. He was. Yeah, that's probably the, that's probably the best free agent signing. Ah, Bogey was a decent free agent yeah. signing. Like, anyway, continue. Sorry. Well, no, I, again, I just think the Jazz are gonna start pushing to get bigger names here in Utah, um, mm-hmm. as well as I think a lot of this has to go with Ryan Smith wanting to just build the state of Utah as well. Yeah, that's an interesting conversation as well. One that we probably don't have time to jump into today. Not in our jazz podcast, no. Yeah. If you want to join in our real estate time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the real estate side of things, we discussed that in population growth. But yeah, so ultimately, I like the move. I do. My only fear, my only reservation is, does Justin Zanuck feel like Ryan Smith brought in Danny Ainge to babysit him and hold his hand? And if that's the case, I could see Zanuck being like, I'm out of here. And I don't think that's the case. I hope not. I, uh, Zanuck, in all of these interviews, what I've read, what he said has been very like, well, but and he's just it's a an interview. guy. No, yeah. But. Yeah. I agree. But I don't think he would go to the extent that he does. Yeah. Like, like that he does. Um, you're usually like, yeah, Danny's a great guy. Like we're going, mm-hmm. he, he, I mean, there's a quote here. There's a little from this from Zanuck. There's literally a guy down the street with 40 years of NBA experience. How can you not have him here? Yeah. Like that doesn't sound like a guy who's just being professional. Either. Yeah, that's true. So I, and again, all speculation, t- only time will tell. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, so I agree with you too. Last thing I'll say on this, I think this move with Danny Ainge is great. I think the only way it affects the jazz that we see as fans is one in trades and two in free agency, which would be awesome. Yeah. But other than that, I don't, I don't think it changes a whole lot. So, um, this next week, yeah, looking forward. We got um, San Antonio on Friday. So the day this comes out, tomorrow for us, but same day, yeah. Friday. Um, home against San Antonio. We have this home run here. Another uh, home stretch. Yep. So Friday we got San Antonio. Saturday, Washington, back-to-back here in Utah. Um, Monday, Charlotte. Thursday, Minnesota. Um we going to cover that Minnesota game next week? We... <laughs> Probably not. That's a couple days before Christmas, so I think we're going to wait for the next yeah, week. Yeah, we, well, <laughs> we'll probably hit that one. Oh, we will? Speaking of Christmas, though, we have a Christmas game, which is nice. Yeah, Dallas, those are always home. exciting. Those are fun. That'll finish the home stretch, the Christmas game. But but yeah, we'll we'll see on that. I, I think we will cover the Minnesota game. So we've got, yeah, like you said, San Antonio, Washington, Charlotte, Minnesota. Wins, losses. 4-0. Jazz keep the streak alive. We push it to 12 games. Yeah, I'm going to go 4-0 on this one as well. I mean, Charlotte's a decent team. You know Washington, what? we just thumbed. So but that's, now we got them at home. I was just say, I think we go 3-1, and one and I think we lose to Washington. To Washington? Yep. I think if we were to lose, it'd be to Charlotte. But uh, Washington's on the tail end of a back-to-back. Well, and... Uh, I don't know. Yes. 4-0. Okay. 4-0. I'm on 3-1, and one and okay. we're losing to Washington. Okay. I only say that just because we beat Thumpton last time, and I think... I They'll come out. Yeah, Brad, maybe. Bradley Bill will get his revenge. Yeah, some, something like that. <laughs> um, okay. Um, next four games, this is the other thing I wanted to say. Donovan, like we talked about, averaging like 28 points a game right now. So over the next four, nothing else, just the next four, you set the over under this time because it seems like I always set it and then I always lose. For Mitchell? Mitchell's points, points over the next four games. 
Over under 28. Under. You're going under? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll take the over. Okay. I'm going to win one. <laughs> <laughs> Is there okay. something you know that I don't? <laughs> no, but I don't think he continues that. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Appreciate you guys. Appreciate you watching. Please leave comments. We like interacting. We do this show. It is fun talking with the two of us, but we do want more interaction and be able to talk to more jazz fans. So please leave a comment if you have anything to say and we'll, uh, we'll discuss with you. Thanks. Appreciate it.